Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Balcavage and Dr. Erica Riggleman. We're back for another uh, edition of the Thyroid Answers podcast. And today we have a special guest on. Veronique Mead is with us today. How are you today? I'm good, Eric. Well, it's great to have you on the podcast. And uh, I just want to kind of get this point out. I, how did I find you and, and come to know who you were? I was Googling uh, cell danger response. I was looking for Dr. Nav, Robert Navio's paper on the cell danger response, and I came across your website. And I'm like, wow, there's somebody else talking about what we talk about all the time. And so I started going through it. The images were great. The studies were great. You've got a ton of great detail on there. And um, I said, this is somebody we need to discuss on the podcast. Because um, we often discuss the cell danger response, which is really part of our topic today. And I think we, we talk about it, we talk about it from a physical, chemical, emotional, microbial response. But you've got a little bit of different take on it from a trauma standpoint. I think that's really important to our listeners because so many people uh, that we see that are struggling with chronic health issues um, aren't aware that maybe some type of traumatic experience has led to their chronic illness. Uh, they may be aware or, or not aware that that's what's causing it. And sometimes when we're dealing with patients, you know, it comes out um, and, but, and sometimes totally unexpectedly. And I, you know, I had that situation with a client when I could, just couldn't get them to do anything and they blurted it out. And we talked about that a little bit, like this is why, and, she was shocked, her, fa her family member was shocked that she said it, and after that, you were like, oh, okay, now all this stuff starts to make more sense. And it was nothing that was ever in the history or anything that we talked about, uh, like leading up to that moment, and when it came out in that moment, it was quite a shock. So before we get into the process, maybe the best thing to do is give us a little of your background, because I think you started as a traditional medical practitioner, that's my dog barking at the, uh, at the guy Hi. who packaged the um, but you, but you got, hey Jax, but you got started in this, you started as a family practitioner and then left family practice to become a somatic trauma therapist. So what happened there? How did you get into, how'd you get into medicine? And then what led you into becoming a somatic, uh, trauma therapist. We'll have Jack in our company as we explore this piece. I am, um, throughout my childhood, I wanted to do something. It felt as simple as I just wanted to be able to help people and I felt really drawn to medicine. And being a family doctor, I really like the idea of having a long-term relationship with patients and being able to work with everything with them and what I found as a family practitioner uh, was I really loved my patients I really wanted to make a difference and the connection I had with them made a really big difference it was really important and I found that practicing traditional medicine was very difficult um, there wasn't that time to have with patients but there was also I had a sense that I wasn't I was, there was something missing in how I was working with folks. It's sort of, um, I didn't feel as though I was really helping them address what was going on underneath, what was happening that was maybe driving chronic illness. And at the time I didn't, I couldn't articulate it in that way. Mostly I just felt as though at some level I was actually causing harm or only providing band-aids for something that had a deeper origin than I was really trained to deal with. And so I left medicine and simultaneously what was happening was that I was beginning to develop fatigue. I called them fatigue attacks at the time uh, because I'd be completely fine and then I'd have a big dip in energy to the point where actually it was, it felt difficult to roll over in bed at night. That's how absolutely exhausted I would be. Um, and I was start starting to have trouble doing sports, like I was windsurfing and skiing and those things, I, I would do that for a little bit and I couldn't continue for a whole day. So why I thought it was a stress response, medicine, medical training, all of that, I just thought, okay, I'm gonna stop medicine, I'm gonna take time off. I took a year off 
de-stressed, slowed down, and my symptoms got worse. And I ended up retraining as a somatic psychotherapist. I got a master's degree in working with how to listen to the body, sort of thinking about it as the body's intelligence. How do I listen to what's actually going on? And my sense back then was that the that symptoms had an intelligence behind them rather than representing something broken. And so all of that led me to, I discovered the meaning of what trauma is when I was in my training at Naropa. And it wasn't just what we tend to think in our culture and in medicine. It wasn't just something that happens to soldiers and veterans or out of war. And it wasn't just PTSD. And I ended up uh, just getting very curious if trauma is a risk factor for PTSD and these other illnesses, is there any chance that it's a risk factor for chronic illness? And that's kind of what got me started. And I've been looking through the research for 20 years, and that's kind of where I've come to and what I can bring today as far as the perspectives that I've been developing. And it's also helped me make sense of my own chronic illness. I ended up becoming disabled by chronic fatigue. It developed very slowly over 10 years until I was mostly bedridden, housebound for almost a year. And that was 10 years ago, and I'm doing much, much better now. I'm not quite out yet, but all the things I've been learning, I've been testing them with myself to see if they make sense, if they help make a difference, and if they help me find tools, and they have. And so that's been another part of the, the exploration. I, I love the whole, the whole concept of the the traumas linked to chronic illness. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I was kind of in the same boat where I felt like I was missing something with my patients. And I knew, you know, I was working on the microbial stress and the, the gut stress and all the other things that, that played a role. And I felt like there was just one piece that was missing. And often these patients coming in had emotional trauma things, deaths, divorce, you know, bad things happen to them in life. And I felt like that was a burden on their body. And I, I didn't know how to help them. And so I had actually sought out some training um, called QNRT, quantum neural reset technique, which kind of got me intro to into this, this kind of field a little bit. Um, never really fully explored it, but definitely opened my eyes that this was an avenue that had to be addressed with a lot of patients. And so you talk about stress and trauma. Could you really describe the difference between the two? Because I think people think that they're, they're often the same, um, but I think that they're very, very different. They are very different. Um, the way I, I come to think about it, I think about um, stress as anything that asks our bodies to adapt. The whole concept of homeostasis is really something that you know, if it gets hot or cold outside, you put on a sweater or you take the sweater off, there's a, a request to the body to adapt to some kind of circumstance. And that's how I think of stress. When you then take the stressor away or you take the sweater off, the physiological response then evens out again or it returns back to baseline. And, and an example I was thinking of um, is, you know, if you've got a plant, a flower in a pot on your deck, and you forget to water it on a particular day, it wilts. It's kind of like wilting is a stress response to not having enough water. It's an intelligent response, actually. Let the leaves go limp, protect the core stem, and then you water the plant, and within an hour or two, it's back to fully normal looking, the flowers are fine, the petals are back, and that's how I think of a stress response. If you remove the stress by adding water in this case, the system comes back, comes fully back. Trauma is a different beast. I think of it, there's a gray zone between them, but trauma is more, if you forget to water that plant for an extra day, it's going to either not come back as fully or have trouble coming back because it's not able to adapt. And that's how I think of, as, of trauma. It's a system that's experiencing something that is just beyond its ability to adapt or well beyond the ability to adapt. So the system gets overwhelmed at some extent or it has to find another coping strategy. It has to maybe at some level freeze or um, it falls into some degree of helplessness. 
And so you water that plant on the second or third day after it's been wilting, it may very well still recover, but it might lose a few leaves or it might lose the buds for the next flowers. It has to sacrifice something in order to help the main core plant survive. And if you think about a plant that gets overly stressed repeatedly, you end up with a plant that's stunted in growth or it has fewer leaves, it doesn't produce blooms. And so that's all of that is how I think of the trauma response. It's, a, it's an experience that we don't either have enough time to adapt to or enough resources to adapt to. And so our systems shift into another gear and it does something else to protect the basic survival at the expense of other, other parts. Is that, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's helpful. I, I think there's a couple things that you said that's really important. One of those is that symptoms have a meaning and we talk about that all the time. Instead of suppressing symptoms, we need to be asking, okay, why is that symptom occurring? And it's the symptom isn't, it's the thing that bugs us, but it's not necessarily the thing that needs to be suppressed or gotten rid of. It should be having us take a deeper look as to what's going on. Like a fever is a great example of that. There's two ways to address a fever. One of those is to suppress it and prevent the fever from occurring. But if you take a look at it from more of a, a functional standpoint, you say, okay, the fever is there as a response to some type of trigger. And the heat that's being generated is there for a reason to try and kill off the threat. So symptoms are there for a reason. We've just gotten very used to suppressing them in kind of the current allopathic model. And so I think that's a really key point is we shouldn't be looking for whether it's a medication or a supplement to suppress every symptom and instead say, hey, why is this symptom occurring? Why is my blood pressure elevated? Why is my blood sugar elevated? What's this telling me about the function of the body? I think the second thing is, and um, you, might, you may be familiar with those terms, is homeostasis you brought up, which is that kind of normal regulating system. Uh, and then the other term that we've used before in the podcast is allostasis, right? Which is, hey, I've, I'm under this excessive stress response and it's something's got to give. And that's more that, I think, more in line with that term you were talking about, like, hey, if there's constant stress on the system, uh, like if the power went out in my house, I can't power the whole house with a, a small generator. I, there's only certain systems that I can plug in. I can plug in the refrigerator and keep the food cold uh, and I can turn on the kitchen light but I can't turn on the hot water heater. So if I want to get a hot shower, I got to unplug the refrigerator and plug in the hot water heater because not everything's going to work. And I think that's where we find a lot of patients is that they are in such chronic uh, stress response into that cell danger response, into allostasis, that they're seeing things break down. They're becoming diabetic. They've got neuropathies. They've got fibromyalgia. They've got these other conditions that are developed as a result of that chronic allostasis, that chronic stress response and limited resources to adapt to it. Would you, would you agree with that? I do. And I think what the field of traumatic stress brings in for me is, uh, and we'll when we talk about the cell danger response, we can get more into that. Um, I think of it as, yes, additive effects over time, but also very likely a pathway that's actually driving these symptoms and that may be a pathway that's gotten stuck rather than just being repeatedly stressed. And you know, we may be talking about very similar things here, but the lens starts for me to help make a little bit of a difference on why is it when you just reduce the stress, for example, that those symptoms don't go away. You know, the diabetes doesn't reverse or the high blood pressure doesn't reverse, even if you retire and you leave that really stressful career and you go on vacation, you know, and for some people, those symptoms will very much decrease when you do that. And for others, they won't. Yeah, I think that comes back down to, I mean, we think about it, even th simple things like a car. I mean, you can drive a car with the wheels out of balance and the, the tires are wearing appropriately. And you, just because you realign the tires or the front end doesn't mean that the tires are now going to, all the, the wear pattern is going to be restored. It's still a wear, an abnormal wear pattern. And you're probably going to have to change out the tires because they've just worn too much. And we see that and then it doesn't matter whether it's a pancreas, a gallbladder, or a, or a blood sugar regulation or a liver function. If you've created enough damage there, just removing the stressor that isn't always enough to help somebody repair, you actually have to help support the repair mechanism to try and get it back to function because it's become 
or as you said, it's, be, it's now moved into a dysfunctional pattern and that's become the new homeostatic regulating pattern, which is this new, or what we would call an allostatic pattern, right? Where that's the way the body works now. And that's where that, that's how that system works efficiently. And we have to actually help somebody get out of that pattern. We see that all the time with patients. When you do, you, they start changing their diet, they change their nutrition. They're like, well, I started eating better. How come I'm not losing weight? Well, because your body's not adapted to burning off those fat stores. It's still running on the calor on the calorie and the glucose intake you're bringing in. You haven't, you've made some changes, but now you got to go back and actually fix some of those, uh, some of those dysfunctional pathways at this point. And I think that's the common language that we have is that there are pathways that are driving the symptoms. And right. what is it that gets those pathways to change back and come back into health? That's really the bottom line question. Yeah, that we're holding. So can you discuss from, at least from your perspective, really what that cell danger response is? Yeah, so you sounds like you talk with your patients a lot about the cell danger response. Dr. Robert Navio at UC San Diego, who has a mitochondrial research lab. And there are sort of five things that I think about when I think about his research. One, um, you know, he's put 60 years worth of research together to develop this theory. And the one, one of the first pieces we've talked about, which is sort of the sense of the intelligence that the body is actually running a process or a pathway as an intelligent response. And it's actually, I, the way I see it is that it's an intelligent attempt to adapt to something. Um, the second is that that intelligent response that leads to symptoms is something that's gotten stuck. It's gotten stuck in a threat response. And that threat response is how I see his, that second piece of the cell danger response that he's really identifying and that's not really how we think of disease. We don't think of disease. We think of it as a genetic thing or a defect or missing enzymes or whatever it is. And what I love about the CDR is that it's really looking at the mitochondria and saying, you know what? We know mitochondria as the primary producers of energy, ATP. That's how we primarily think of it. But what Dr. Navio is bringing out is that they actually have a second primary activity, which is a threat response and defense. It's the danger response. And so what he talks about is um, like a third thing is that things like stressors, the things that might tip us over the edge to make us sick, they're actually triggers. Um, they're not the cause. And right. I'm, yeah, and you mentioned that very early. And so what he's found when he does his research, he did a study on chronic fatigue, for example. And what he's found is that uh, those, there's about five groups that might trigger the onset of a chronic illness. It might be biological, like mold or infections. It could be chemical, like a toxin. But it could also be psychological or physical trauma. Psychological trauma being something, say, like... Um, having an experience of not being nurtured, not having connection with parents growing up. That can be very subtle. A physical trauma could be something like a car accident or surgery. Um, and then the fifth one he says is a cause unknown. But when they studied their patients, they found that they had either one or more of those triggers before the onset of an illness. And when he's talking about the cell danger response, he's really saying, this is the last straw. It's not actually the cause. And in medicine, we tend to focus on the infection that triggered the onset of an illness and we treat that, but it doesn't resolve the diabetes or the autoimmune disease. So what I love about the CDR is that he's saying, look, this is actually because of a pathway. This is a cell danger response that has gotten stuck in a threat response of fight, flight, or freeze. And this has been developing for a very long time for a lot of people, sometimes since childhood or pre perinatal events. So that's part of what I really love about it. And the, the other two pieces that I find really helpful about the CDR is he talks about how there are a hundred or more diseases really that are driven by a cell danger response. And the fifth one is that, and this is the ultimate one that while we're talking about in the show is that these diseases may be reversible because the cell danger response is simply a system that's perceiving threat and responding in a certain pathway that's gotten really strengthened. If we can shift the perception 
and shift that sense of threat and threat response, then theoretically we should be able to reverse symptoms. Right. And I think one of those things that's really important because we have a bunch of people who have to, who, and this is the thyroid answers podcast and people are going, yeah, but what is this, how does that relate to my thyroid issues? And so I want, what I want to point out is one of the ways that the cell danger response engage, when it becomes activated in this process is engaging. One of the ways that cell physiology is kind of managed is thyroid hormone plays a massive role in that. And so when a cell is perceiving danger, if there's inflammation, one of the things that happens inside the cell, away from the thyroid gland, is the deactivation of thyroid hormone. And that's really important because when you have the deactivation of thyroid hormone, there's less T3 reaching the nucleus. And, uh, and, and when there's less T3 reaching the nucleus and less T3 to support the mitochondria, then the mitochondria shrink, we increase oxidative stress. And when there's less thyroid hormone in the tissue, some of the normal things we associate with metabolism get downregulated. It's like turning the lights off in the house because we don't need that energy to light up the whole house. We need it to do a different purpose. And when thyroid hormone is downregulated, there's different types of receptors within the cells. There's cells that when T3 binds to the receptor, they become activated. And when T3 is not reacting to other receptors, then signals turn on. So that sometimes thyroid hormone turns things off like inflammatory mechanisms, and sometimes thyroid hormone turns things on. So when there's cellular hypothyroidism, this down regulation of thyroid hormone within a cell that's perceiving danger, thyroid hormone is deactivated, and when there's less T3 in there, it can help trigger those cell or cell defense mechanisms. And I think that's a big thing that's not talked about in, in, in our community, even in medicine. And we look at the, and the person's going to start to experience symptoms as a result of this thyroid hormone signaling within the cell that isn't an accident. It's a normal defense mechanism due to whatever that cell danger response is. And so you can have hypothyroid symptoms in cells and tissues have a perfectly normal functioning thyroid gland but when that thyroid hormone gets to those cells or tissues that are in a danger response, that thyroid hormone is being deactivated. And I use that term lightly because that's not really the right term, but it's being converted not into T3, but into reverse T3 or T3 is being converted into T2. So it's not stimulating the normal metabolism of build cells, build tissues, build energy and burn more fuel, but more to support this defense response. Yeah, so it's like you're talking about the micro level. And if I talk about the macro level, say from a trauma perspective, what um, Dr. Navio and the CDR are also talking about is that this is a system whose pathway has gotten stuck in either a freeze response or a fight flight response or some variation of them. Um, the freeze response would be the hypothyroid. It's sort of our nervous systems do this and it also happens at a cellular level in different tissues and so it would be one thought that i would have would be we're looking at a system that instead of being in fight flight attempt to escape attempt to fight attempt to adapt in that it's actually ad adapting or trying to adapt in the other direction which is a default when you can't fight flight and so that perspective would be that our bodies would say, oh, we're going to actually head towards the shutdown mechanism because look, we're in a drought like the plant. We have to wait until we get the water. And so there's nothing we can do to escape the situation or flee it. And so we actually shut down and that there's an intelligent process that's driving that shutting down response. Yeah. And part of that process is, hey, it, the way I shut it down is I don't keep stimulating metabolism. And, and exactly. The body, and the way to do that is, hey, let's deactivate or yeah. downregulate this cell metabolism because yeah. we, can't, we can't keep generating energy, A, if we don't have it. We don't want to keep revving up a cell that's got an infection or that there's a stressor in because what you're going to do is you're going to generate more sick cells, create more issues. So it is a mechanism at the cellular level, at the tissue level to do it. And Dr. what Dr. Eric and I talk about a lot on the podcast is, if that stays persistent, then many times what we see is 
those damaged or danger, those cells in that danger response, releasing things like damps and PAMPs from the cells. Those damps and PAMPs then trigger the immune response and autoimmunity. And now we wind up with a gland that is now under attack. And we say, oh my gosh, the immune system's out of control and we, there's nothing you can do. It's just, you know, whatever. And we're looking at this from a totally different perspective and saying, wait a second, the autoimmune response is there for a reason. It's trying to protect. And I always, I explain to patients like, listen, if you have one cell that you're trying to downregulate metabolism, it's easy. You do it in one cell. If you've got trillions of cells that need to be downregulated, the more likely thing to do is turn off the source. <clears throat> and of, of course, in this situation, the source is the gland, right? Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is uh, there's some papers talking about how the immune system talks about how the autoimmune process gets triggered. And what, they're, and what uh, some of these papers are talking about is when the danger response is gone, that it is the bone marrow that actually restarts the thyroid response, which is really, really interesting. It, the bone marrow restarts the thyroid physiology when the danger signal's gone. Now, the issue is if the danger signal's not gone, like you're stuck, right, in what you're talking about, then yeah, the autoimmune process doesn't go away because the, it, the, the thyroid tissue and the immune system hasn't gotten the signal from the bone marrow that, hey, danger's gone, let's kick this thing back into gear. And they actually show that the bone marrow actually produces the TSH to can, that can restart the thyroid gland and the tissue production. It's pretty interesting stuff. It's we, fascinating, it's, yeah. I, like I said, we take a look at this from different angles, but I think we're, but we're still talking about the same thing. And that's why it's so important to our patients to hear this uh, discussion, because, you know, if you're trying to, well, I want to get my antibodies lower. Well, you're not, you can force them, you can try and force them lower. You take, take more vitamin D, that'll suppress them. That'll get them lower. Uh, you can take some other things to force them lower, but really the only long-term solution is to find what's triggering that cell danger response and try and get that cell that and that those tissues or the body in general out of its stuck response and get it back into function. So maybe you can build on that discussion we you were just having, like what is, how can stress or trauma um, induce a CDR and what's the impact on the physiology? You were talking about fight, freeze and flight. So can you exp express those or explain those a little bit better? Yeah, so what you were just saying about the bone marrow, I mean, that's such an exciting recent study. It's really, is it the bone marrow? Is it the nervous system? Is it the thyroid? Our bodies are so complex. And when we try to just do one thing, say vitamin D, mm -hmm. it, it, some people are actually going to have a side effect to the vitamin D potentially because you're trying to suppress their threat response, their survival response. That could be one way of looking at triggers and flares. And so looking at fight, flight, and freeze, um, the, the thing that another difference between trauma and stress is that the trauma piece is something that gets the pathway stuck. And so it's like what you just described about the bone marrow, it doesn't get the message. And so what um, Dr. Robert scares a neurologist who talks about this and that it's any experience that is too overwhelming for the system to adapt to, that requires some degree of relative helplessness or freeze is a system that gets our system stuck. And this is what actually makes the message fail to give that signal that it's all clear. So someone who's experienced a childhood traumatic event, let's say they've been in a couple accidents, their system would want to go into fight flight. That's what we all want to do. We want to, uh, our systems, tend to primarily want to respond to escape something or fight it off so that we can successfully overcome the adversity. And that's, I think, where the primary understanding of the stress response is. And when we can fight that, um, fight the small dog or run away from the small dog and we succeed in escaping, that actually gives the nervous system or the body or the tissue the message that it's over. 
The problem is when it's really about the degree or how it's perceived or how overwhelming or how difficult it is to adapt to. If we are unable to feel that sense of having successfully escaped or survived, Usually that's because we've had to go into some degree of freeze, collapse, not saying anything. Um, child abuse might be one of the big ways to understand this. A child can't fight the person, the adult who's attacking them. They also can't escape, typically. It's in their family system or they're too strong or they're not fast enough. What the system does in that case is it goes into relative freeze. And that's where we have symptoms like relative numbness, feeling kind of dissociated, things slowing down, um, getting cold, our metabolism shutting down. That freeze response is what gets our nervous systems to really go into that protective response. It's going to protect survival like the plant, even if we have to lose a few leaves or stop producing flowers. In the long run, that's part of how the message for the pathway begins to build and get it stuck. If we never got the message that we're safe, if we never got the message that it's over, if we had to freeze because there was no other solution, then that's actually part of what drives a pathway, a threat response to get stronger over time. And if we then have other experiences that lay on top of that, that's where other threat responses like infections, like um, toxin exposures, those trigger a, a, a threat response also. But if we've already got a pathway that's developing, it may just strengthen that same pathway. Different threat response, different threats, same pathway. So this, is that making sense at all to answer that question? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I think, absolutely. I, I think it, it is the understanding that people can experience these things and when, it, like you said, it is overwhelmed, overwhelming to the system or they, they, at the end of the danger, they, they can't recover from it, it kind of gets stuck. But I think it's really interesting that every person's different and what's going to be overwhelming to their system. Yes. I think yeah. that it can be, I, I mean, I've read studies where it could be just, you know, uh, you know, maybe you were born and you're, then you had a sibling born and you felt like there was neglect, even though there may have not been neglect, there could have been that feeling of neglect. Um, it doesn't have to be these huge traumatic things that we often think are life-changing emotional things. It can be little, little minor things that can, that can cause these things. And I think that that's why sometimes people will look at other people's lives and say, oh, well, they've had, they've been through way worse and they're fine, but I, I should be fine. And they're kind of comparing their two. So how can somebody have, two people have the same experience and maybe one person, this experience causes a, you know, a trauma that can cause cell danger response. Can you explain that a little bit? Exactly. And what you're naming is really, really important because we are, we've become so focused as a society and in medical care on just what the big things are that we think of as trauma that we are overlooking these seemingly smaller things. And I'll name that in a second, but just, just to address, you mentioned the pre and perinatal piece, like um, a sense of having a sibling born. If a, if a parent's attention, a mother's attention or father's is focused on the other baby, let's say, maybe that baby had to be in the intensive care unit and it took everything the parents had, the other child can have an, an experience that actually feels life-threatening to their nervous system of not having enough of that nurturing presence and support. And it seems so minor, but the nervous system, the cells, the tissues can have that response that is actually more than a stress response. And the younger we are, the more vulnerable we are. And so how two people could have the same experience, but have different responses, there's a couple different ways to look at that. One of them is that, you know, if I think of the plants again, and we just had a, a snow here yesterday and depending on how cold it actually gets you might have a couple plants in your yard that are exposed to the same snow the same temperature drop and one of them will come through just fine and one of them won't and it could be partly genetic you know an underlying genetic risk factor for propensity to go in a particular direction like spring plants like tulips and irises have no problems with the snow no response, no reaction, they'll just pop right back up. But my zinnias that are annuals will actually freeze and they're done. Another middle range is that you might have a plant that's on the porch underneath an awning and so it protects it from the temperature. 
sort of, so if you have two people in the same car accident, it may be that one of them has a more, a bigger buffer, more protection, like being under the porch roof and not having as much coal land on them. It may be that they had more resources, more support, more nurturing when they were growing up, that they have a system that's got a built-in better balance and doesn't go into a freeze helplessness response. While the other person, maybe they have a, a greater imbalance, they've had more adversities in their past than nurturing, and so they already have a system that's primed or a pathway that's already triggers more easily into a threat response. So one of those things is, that's one of the things we find soldiers that develop PTSD tend to have a larger history of trauma in their past. So that's one of the examples. And just to, that piece to know that we may have had more buffers, more resources in our life that also protects us. Or it might be that uh, in a car accident, one person's a race car driver who's been trained and this is actually something that gives them a thrill or that they find exciting or that they feel empowered around or that they know how to get out of. And so they don't go into a helplessness response because their system actually has a way through and the other one doesn't. So it's a lot of very subtle complex factors that add up to make differences like that. You yeah. had talked about the, the pre thin things that have happened in the past. Um, do you also believe that maybe there's a transgenerational component to it? Maybe the traumas that happened in your, your parents or your grandparents' life could be, you know, essentially taken down the genetic line. Do you believe that there's a component to that as well? I do. Um, there's a whole, I've been breaking things down into groups of types of trauma and adverse multi-generational experiences. Dr. Rachel Yehuda has done research with Holocaust survivors. Mostly though, she ended up studying their kids their kids have a nervous system that is more easily triggered into a stress response, even with things that are less stressful and that the control group doesn't respond to. And um, Dr. Michael Meany and uh, Moss Schiff at McGill University had a groundbreaking study that came out in, I think, 2004, where they're finding an even closer sort of relationship. If a mother rat is not nurturing in her behaviors towards her pups within a very specific one week window of that pups, rat pup's first life, the pups develop an epigenetic change. So it's not actually a genetic thing they're inheriting, it's actually that the mother's behaviors affect how the pup's nervous system, immune system, organ system responds and <laughs> <laughs> to respond to stress. <laughs> Dax is kind of highlighting that in a way, you know. The rat pups end up with an epigenetic change on their receptors for cortisol that may last for life and then continue into the grand pups, you know, the grandkids. And so there are epigenetic changes that happen based on how one parent interacts with their kids. So if trauma affects a parent's ability to be present or nurturing or supportive, it affects and interacts with the, the baby's physiology. And there are other studies showing, beginning to show that this is one of the ways that epigenetics, that transgenerational trauma can uh, have an effect on the next generation and on generations after that. And we see that with other things like smoking, alcohol, those things can have an epigenetic genetic modifier. So, you know, for the, for the people listening, one of those things that, you know, people get their genetic profiles and they're looking at their gene snips and saying, oh, I got this, I got that. But really what we're trying to talk, talk about here is that the experiences of your family members, you know, prior to you even coming, becoming you can influence how the genes trend, you know, how, how, those genes are going to behave. You don't have to have any polymorphism or defect in the gene or alteration in the gene itself, but based how, you know, if your mom and dad were smokers or their parents were smokers, that can influence how those ge their genes work and that will translate to you when you're born. And so the same thing with these trauma experiences is, is, what, is what we're kind of saying here is that you may not have had the traumatic experience, but somebody else may have really had a traumatic experience. And that kind of, that shapes your habits and behaviors in your life. And it seems 
it seems like a little wooey, I think, for some people to, to see that, but we actually have the clinical research to show that. I think the other thing I wanted to kind of point out, and you kind of brought this up, and we were talking about some people, while some people are more, you know, how stress impacts some or trauma impacts some, seem to, some people seem to be okay, some not. Um, and we talk about, you know, if there's other factors that are, they're, they're predispositioned to, they already have a blood sugar problem, they already have an adrenal problem, they already have poor lifestyle habits, those things, and then add a trauma to it, they may not be uh, as adaptable to it. But I think there's another thing to kind of think about, and I think you were, were hinting on that, is that, you know, some of us have had traumatic experiences in our, in our early on in life. And I look at it like, training for a, as an, you know, as a runner, an endurance athlete, um, doing lots of training, it prepares you for the big marathon, right? You are more adaptable to it. And so those stressors, if, if I've had those stressors or those traumas early on, and now I have, um, and now I have another traumatic experience, but I've already been conditioned and I've overcome those, those stressors can prepare me maybe to manage a trauma, traumatic experience a little bit better than somebody who maybe never had any of those traumas or never had any excessive uh, traumatic experience. Maybe they, it's like they, if they got out up and they say, hey, I'm going to go run a marathon. Did you ever have any training before? No. So I'm going to go run, a, going to try and run a marathon and, they, and their body breaks down uh, versus the person who's done a lot of training, they've had a lot of experiences, they may be able to adapt a little bit better than the person who's never had any of that experience. And I don't fully agree with the um, trauma may make you more resilient. The way I would see it is if you've had trauma and had enough support, enough time, enough space to actually so that your system actually learns a way through that that is empowering to the system and that turns off any threat response, then that may be a way that your system is strengthened. So maybe you grow up in a, an unsafe neighborhood, but you had parents who were really nurturing, who really got it, who were actually able to find their way through and get you out of that neighborhood and themselves as well, there may be some way in which that could build resilience um, so that you can recognize things more quickly or respond more quickly later on. But some of that's going to be a stress response and a trauma response if we uh, haven't actually fully recovered from those traumas early in life. And then we get one more and it throws us completely over the edge. It's not because um, we were strong and this is just one trauma that made the difference. It's because we've had lots of little traumas that didn't actually get resolved. And we may have built some kind of a strong fight response towards it or flight response towards it that's mobilized. And then something throws us over the edge and we get sick or we have some other symptoms. That could actually be a pathway, a trauma pathway. Our culture tends to really value and put a lot of positive twist on people who are fast, strong, a little hypervigilant, uh, workaholics, but that's a bit of a trauma response actually. And so there's a, um, there's a place where I would say there's a difference between training because we've had a lot of nurturing and support and our systems are actually more flexible and adaptable than having had a lot of difficulties that have made us actually someone who's in a pathway that has a lot more fight flight in it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I okay. think there's, there's a balance there between the first, I mean, because there are people who've had some really traumatic experiences. They've overcome those, right? And, and they've come out the, the other end. And then the next time they have a traumatic experience, they're, they're more adaptable to it. And there's other people that have traumatic experiences and they just keep, continue to get compounded and compounded and compounded yeah. and they can't adapt. Yeah. So um, I think maybe my analogy wasn't fantastic, but I think the idea is, is that just because you have a traumatic experience, it doesn't mean you can't recover. True. Absolutely. Uh, it doesn't mean that yeah, a traumatic experience is, you know, none of us really want a traumatic experience, but nope. if you can get out of that traumatic experience, learn, recover, over and overcome, 
then it puts you in a better position sometimes when the next traumatic experience comes along. Absolutely. That, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think there's also a component that some people will confuse, you know, having a bad trauma and thinking that they got through it and it may be, yeah, they pushed through it, but there may be still things that are stuck that are in the subconscious that they may not even know, which then why the next trauma that they get is like the straw that breaks the camel's back. Then they've got all these problems. So, you know, there's, or people think they may have gotten through, you know, a trauma there, there may be issues that still may be stuck, I think. So I think there's a lot of listeners here sitting, listening to this saying, oh, well, I've, I've had the worst life ever. I've had this, this, and this happen to me. What, what do you tell them at this point? Because they're probably sitting there thinking that they're, they're screwed. They're, there's no hope for them. So what can somebody do that, that knows that maybe they've had some traumatic things happen in their life and maybe, maybe that's caused their chronic illness? What is the next step or what should they do to help kind of get themselves unstuck? There's a number of things. The first, I think, most important message in what we're talking and why we're here today is that the effects of trauma, even if they happen in childhood, even if you were a baby, even if they're multi-generational, there's, they're reversible. There's a lot of reversibility because it's not in your genes. It's actually in the epigenetics. And you know, even like the smoking epigenetic changes that you were talking about earlier, Eric, that comes down and that you might've inherited, epigenetics have been shown to be reversible, even if it's a relational thing like in the rat pups that I, we mentioned earlier. And so the first thing is for folks to notice that you're not screwed. There's actually a lot of hope. And if you understand, the more we understand about the science of trauma, the more we understand about how pathways strengthen over time, the more we're gonna be able to acknowledge that they might've played a role and then look for ways and understand ways that might be appropriate for us to beginning to shift them. And so if, if you are beginning to recognize that maybe there have been events that happen in your life and maybe they've affected your risk of developing a chronic illness, the next thing to know is that it's not psychological. The effects of trauma as also as we've been discussing, change how our cell danger response works. It changes how our nervous system perceives threat. It changes how our immune system works because everything's oriented in a threat response instead of a healthy, normal um, baseline of safety. These others are also normal and natural and intelligent, but they are no longer needed when the threat's gone. So knowing that it's not in your head I think is also really critical because we have a huge amount of judgment in our system and in our medical model as well about trauma. And so a lot of people will have gotten told, been told that, especially if they have symptoms without a clear diagnosis. So I think that's a second piece that actually can be helpful in the process of healing. So if we're not judging or blaming ourselves, if we don't think we're weak and it's not a psychological thing, then we have again more empowerment to look at tools. So the tools, as I think of them, one of them that folks don't do, like you guys in the work that you do are already doing a ton of things that decrease the threat response, whether it's diet or whether it's certain things that support cellular health, whether it's exercise. But for a lot of folks, that isn't enough. And that's part of why I think we're talking here today too. And so one example is that there are somatically based trauma therapies that work with the nervous system to unwind and resolve that pathway that never got that signal that it's over. And so as we work from a trauma perspective, the goal is to help the system get that signal. Because once the signal happens, all these things can shift on their own because our bodies are actually innately designed to recover and adapt and come back to baseline. So some of the somatic therapies um, are things like EMDR we've heard about, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. That may be the one that's the most familiar, which is why I'm naming it first. Um, somatic experiencing or SE is one. Sensory motor psychotherapy, uh, EFT, the tapping technique, emotional freedom technique. And there are others, but that's one way to really work with the trauma piece if you have a sense that you've had trauma. And if you don't have a sense that you've experienced trauma, which is really quite common. Yeah. Yeah, really common. Most of us don't think we've ever had trauma. When I was first researching this, I looked at the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. It's called the ACE study, it looks at 10 specific types of trauma. And my ACE score is zero. 
And most people who look at that and have an A score of zero say, yeah, I didn't have any trauma, so you know, this isn't an issue for me. But some of the things we've been talking about today, whether it's the pre and perinatal piece, the multi-generational piece, the not enough uh, nurturing piece, those influence the development and trajectory of our systems as well. And these kinds of therapies can really help the system shift be, by getting that signal that it's done, that it's over. So how does somebody who's struggling with chronic illness, maybe they're aware, maybe they're not aware, maybe more importantly for the person who's not aware that they've had a traumatic experience, how, are they going, how do they identify that that may be at their root? I think the easiest, quickest way would be, look, are things working? Are the medications that work for other folks? Because meds do sometimes work for people really well. Are they working for you? And if they're not, if you have side effects with things like vitamin D or B12 or an enzyme, or if you're having side effects, if you are not, your system is not responding to really appropriate traditional approaches of any kind, then that's one red flag to think about. Oh, my system's not responding. It could be because we're trying to remove a threat response that actually still feels a need for survival. So that would be one quick way to identify that and not have to even know if there's a trauma history. It's probably the, the simplest one. Um, another is if you do have a trauma history, but like we're talking about, a lot of people don't realize that they have a, a trauma history themselves. And so um, it could also be symptoms. Um, we tend to categorize symptoms into different diseases, but symptoms of fight, flight, and freeze are indicators. So if you have a lot of anxiety or depression, clearly those come with thyroid diseases and all kinds of other symptoms, but they're also the two most common emotional symptoms of trauma or an effect of trauma. Um, feeling hypervigilant, irritable, um, easily stressed, having trouble settling your system, relaxing, feeling safe, having difficulty connecting or feeling really connected with people, those are all signs of the fight flight end of the spectrum that are stuck. Our systems in health are able to shift gears and come back and sleep, for example. So if your sleep is disrupted, you know, that's another indicator. On the freeze, collapse uh, end of the system, it's again, it's a nervous system piece. It's not a willpower thing. It's not something we're doing on purpose, but that's where we might have depression, feel cold, um, be really tired, have um, difficulty thinking, being kind of dissociated or numb. Those are on the freeze end of the spectrum. And our gut symptoms, you know, we can have diarrhea and um, a lot of pain and bloating. That can be the fight, flight end of the spectrum constipations on the freeze end of the spectrum. So that can be one way to also think of it is, are my symptoms kind of caught in fight, flight, freeze? And this can also be if you're super sensitive to things, whether it's foods, whether it's fluorescent lightings in the store, whether it's really sensitive to sounds, those can all be represent a form of threat to a system that's really super sensitized. So that's another way of thinking about it. So for the person who's, you know, they've, I've been to multiple functional medicine practitioners, I've done the gut thing, I've done the diet thing, yeah, uh, and nothing seems to get better. Uh, you definitely, it's worth going down that route and looking at trauma as an underlying cause or factor. And I think for, for Dr. Erica, myself, and many functional med medicine practitioners, it is something that they take into consideration. I think more people are starting to understand that. Um, and... I think one of those things is, I mean, if you have an individual symptom or condition and you address it and it gets better, great, but most people don't have an individual symptom or condition. What most people have is what I call multi-system adaptive disorder, which is when there's this chronic trauma, this chronic stress, multiple systems start to become compromised because the body's adapting. There's some type of trauma, there's some type of stress. It's the whole idea that the power went out and the generator's on things have to shut down. So it's not unusual that you have a thyroid issue, an adrenal issue, a GI issue, a sleep disruption issue, all at the same time. Yeah. You, you don't have 20 different disorders. What you have is 
the, the body's adaptive response to some type of chronic danger signal. And getting to that root issue, whether it's microbial or physical trauma or emotional trauma or uh, psychological trauma or organisms, the, the, the underlying theme here to this podcast and all the ones we've done so far is you got to identify what those stressors or traumas are that are causing the system to be and put you where you are. And if you don't, and you just try and mask it with medications or supplements, that is not the long-term solution. And often you're, you're the person who's gone from practitioner to practitioner to practitioner because that you, you didn't investigate that those other options of things that could be doing it, like some, tra- some type of traumatic experience that has not gotten unstuck. So Veronique, I, I, you, this is a great podcast. We appreciate you being on. Uh, we'll have to get you back because there's probably a lot more we can discuss and talk about. Um, but for the listeners, I'll put some of your contact information. Uh, it, for listeners who want to get more information about your what you provide and your website's a great source, why don't you tell them where they can find your material, your information, so they can learn more about the trauma experience. My blog is called Chronic Illness Trauma Studies. And so Google that. And one of the places to look would be in the menu under tools. And I've got a 10 tools that work, which is really about how we add. Trauma is just one of the many tools that we can add, but it's one that's being, has been overlooked and not recognized. And also under tools is a therapies, my favorite books and my favorite therapies. And so they can find links to find therapists around the world in the databases for different kinds of therapies in that post. And so that could just be a place to get started. Uh, My homepage also has kind of an overview of the different topics on my blog that might give them a place to start. Awesome. Well, I thank you for coming on. We will be sure to get you back on. Uh, Dr. Erica, any final comments? No, I just think this is a, a great piece that people often don't think could be causing some of their issues. So I'm, gl- I'm glad that we could get you on and discuss it. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much, you guys, for having me. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in and listening to this episode of Thyroid Answers Podcast. Uh, be sure to share this one with your friends and family. And uh, Veronique, thank you so much for coming on. And we'll, we'll be sure to get you back on soon, okay? My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks.